So instead of having to grow the full animal, where there's a lot of the shells, the heads, and all of that that we don't eat, now we only produce specifically the parts we eat. Because we built it as Lego blocks, one of the huge benefits is that some of us are really concerned about cholesterol in seafood. Even just using the muscle and no fat additions, we can recreate the similar taste and texture. I think the biggest challenge is people when you're doing startup. It changes very quickly as we continue to grow. We started with just two people less than three years ago and we have 30 over people on our team now. Hi, everyone. So we're very delighted to have Dr. Ka Yi Ling today to do this interview with us. Actually, Dr. Ka Yi Ling is one of our colleagues, uh, cousin. I'm sure you guys, if you watch our channel, you might have known Ayman. So Dr. Ka Yi is Ayman's cousin. So we're very, very happy to have Dr. Ka Yi to join us for this interview today. So a very, very interesting topic today. Something that I have no idea. I've never heard really learn anything about, but I'm very interested to learn a little bit more as getting a little older. I'm interested to learn a little bit more about my health as well. So quick background a bit on Dr. Ka Yi. So she's a co-founder and CTO of Shok Meat. So it's a cell-based uh, crustacean company, which is uh, based in Singapore and recently raised 4.6 million US dollar in their second round of fundraising. So Dr. Ka Yi studied developmental and stem cell biology and has over 10 years of experience in tracing and studying stem cells. Who she has also frequently taken part in science and outreach and speaks at a lot of different food sustainability and career management events. So in 2020, Dr. Ka Yi was also awarded MTech Asia's innovator under 35. So welcome Dr. Ka Yi, thank you for taking time out with us today. Hi Jackie and thanks Manita for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks again for coming. All right, so a quick introduction for our audience and a little bit of your background. So we know that you study stem cell biology and a lot of uh, research in this type of uh, area. Can you give us for like regular people that have no idea what this part of science in this development. Can you give us a little bit of your background and how did you come up with this uh, company as a startup? Yes, I've always been interested in research. How I really got into this area was really when I learned from the news about Dolly the sheep when cloning began. So that's mm. kind of when a lot of, well, not really that, but it's kind of the idea of stem cells, regeneration, how do you reproduce and regrow certain parts of the living body? Um, so that was what I was always interested in. And I studied for a long time, did my PhD, and then did some research after that. And that's where I met my co-founder, who's our CEO, mm. Dr. Sandhya. And she has been a serial entrepreneur. Stroke Meets is actually her third startup. And she wanted to do something. She's also trained as a stem cell scientist. She wanted to know or decide what to do, you know. On the stem cell research side, we know that's what we have the technical skills for, but what kind of human problems we can solve or help to do greater good for the society. And in general, most of the startups who are based around the stem cell technology fall into two big areas. One is in the medical area where they look into regenerative medicine, where you reproduce organs, artificial organs. Um, there's a lot of research in that area, and that's a huge basis for what we do as we do in the cell base or cultivated meats area. So medical or food. So those are the two big areas where a lot of startups are focused on. What we do on the food side is basically use stem cell technology and reproduce only the parts we eat. So meats are generally made up of muscle and fat. In beef and pork and chicken, there might be more things like blood vessels, skin and all that. But in fish and seafood, most of it is in the muscle and the fat area. And basically, we use the technology to build them like Lego blocks. So we produce a lot of muscle Lego blocks and fat Lego blocks. And then we piece them back together to make whatever food types we're interested in. Interesting. So I have a little bit more understanding of this area. So you mentioned a little bit about building like a Lego block and with the stem cell. Can you explain a little bit? So what are some advantages of these cells cultured meat or cell cultured uh, products that you guys make uh, as regular 
people like us, I don't I have no idea what's the difference between this and eating a piece of meat that I buy from the grocery store. So can you explain a little bit about what's the difference between those two? Theoretically, there's no difference. We're basically mm -hmm. producing what you eat. It's just a new production process. So think of it as a different machine of making okay. it. So instead of having to grow the full animal where there's a lot of the shells, the heads and all of that that we don't eat, now we only produce specifically the parts we eat. So in essence, there's not really much difference. It is meat. It's not trying to make vegetables to be like meat, like some of the plant-based foods yeah. we see out there. So in terms of nutrition and taste, theoretically, it's equivalent or it's almost the same benefits what can we get out of it because we built it as lego blocks one of the huge benefit is that some of us are really concerned about cholesterol in seafood especially mm. in shrimp crab and lobster but now that we're building them as lego blocks we don't need to incorporate to put the fat lego blocks together with the muscle mm. which is the main protein part that we eat a lot of and we're interested in. And from a lot of our early showcases or demos that we have done, even just using the muscle and no fat additions, we can recreate the similar taste and texture that we're looking for in the dumplings, in the crab cakes, in the soups we make. So that's really exciting. So. A healthier product is one that we can look out for. And why are we looking at this in the first place? Why there are a lot of people investing or working on this alternative protein, be it plant-based or the cell cultured space? That's because the population is continuing to grow at a rapid rate. But the way that we're consuming food is not sustainable at the moment, especially for seafood, which is not something we realize a lot about and think did, a lot about. I did about. not know that too. <laughs> The ocean is limited and we keep taking from it, be it from fishing or farming, but then that's leading to a lot of the species being extinct. So we're mm. not getting enough time to grow them to the size we want. There's limit of how much is left. And the ocean itself is also very polluted. It's one connected water body. Whether you throw in your chemicals from the US or Europe, it still connects back to Asia as well. And that's basically what's happening with mercury, microplastics, heavy metals, all of this, where does it go? The seafood is swimming and basically consuming everything in it. These harmful chemicals are being accumulated in the body of the seafood we eat. So with our cell cultured meats, we are no longer trying to grow the animals in the ocean itself, be it by farming or fishing. So we are not worried about the contamination that we find in the ocean. We don't have to use those chemicals. So that is another benefit of itself as well and also the environmental impact and at the end of the day we wouldn't have to be killing one shrimp to eat one shrimp from our technology one shrimp can give us equivalent of thousands millions of shrimp in there so in animal cruelty sense we're basically not sacrificing and harming as much animals as well Okay, very interesting stuff. That would probably already is a big investment area where a lot of hedge funds or mutual funds are interested in investing. So from it sounds like with the meat and the seafood we're eating, we're running out, right? So I'm guessing that's something a lot of people are interested in. Okay, so let's get to the side in terms of creating a startup. So I think a lot of our subscribers would like to know a little bit more from the entrepreneur side. From your experience, what do you think is the most critical or the most fundamental element of creating your startup? startup shock meat. I think what I've seen and experienced is the crucial part of a startup is the founders, the people you work with and start the company. Mm. I think for us, we're a technical startup, we're a deep tech startup. It was great that my CEO co-founder, she is a scientist herself, even though she has the business experience. So she knows what our science can do. And mm. I think the relationship between me and her being able to work together is also really important. And that's actually, with a lot of good startups, there's the issues might come up, not because of the technology itself, but because of the relationship between the founders itself. So yeah, mm. I think that's the, the basis and the key thing. Definitely agree. Yeah, that's 
very key. Working with the right people doesn't matter what you do, in a sense, right? Because you're still working with the people that has speak the same language as you. All right. So uh, we have mentioned before in the introduction that your company recently raised 4.6 million US dollar in your second round of fundraising. Can you let our audience know a little bit about any difficulties in terms of raising fund in this area, or how were you guys able to approach different investors in this area? Yes, actually, I think today we have raised a total of about 30 million US dollars so wow. far. We're quite lucky to be in this space at the right time with the right market. It's not easy to raise funds in Asia, I think, in general. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our early investors came from the US, actually, more than in Asia. And over time, as we built our name, then um, especially after we got into Y Combinator in 2019, that helped a lot of the other investors to commit to us as well. So we started off being able to get a first few investors who had really good networks, even though they were angels and put in relatively smaller amounts. They were the ones who brought in a lot of the later investors as well. And how do we reach out to them? These were investors who were actually friends or people that my CEO co-founder Sandhya knew from her previous startups. So her first startup she did, she actually did a biotech science news website. So she actually interviewed a lot of the different investors or the people who were starting their own startups in the cell-based meat area four or five years ago when the sector completely just started. So she actually built her network from quite early on before we started Shook Meat and that helped a lot when we started to know the right people to talk to and then that helped build the network. Y Combinator, I think, definitely helped us to kind of give a stamp of recognition as well of what we did. But at the end of the day, in the early stages, I think what separated us or what most investors are looking for are the founders, the idea, what is your unique advantage? So for us, we were trained in the technical area. So they were, they felt confident in us on the technical sense. But at least one of us, Sandhya, she had previous startup experience and business development experience. So there's a balance of both. So if you're a completely technical team, it's very difficult to start your own startup as well. It's good to have someone with the business knowledge because there's so much things that need to be done in the early days as well. And the idea itself that we were focusing on a unique type of animal, there weren't that many people working on seafood when we started as well, but all of them were doing fish. So we picked shrimp, crab and lobsters that nobody else was working on. So that piqued a lot of interest from investors and that we wanted our market focus to be mostly in Asia Pacific was another advantage because most of the companies when we started were all based in the US. Um, so they're mostly US focus and then that being our focus in Asia really made a difference for them as well. Okay, interesting. How does the business model work in this area? So is it very straightforward? Investors come in and then you guys create the R&D and then create some new products like you mentioned, shrimp, lobster or shellfish. Who do you sell these products to usually? Is it restaurants or is there like a wholesaler? How does it usually work in the business model? Most of the cell based company will start off selling to restaurants. It's going to mm. be kind of like the impossible foods route because we start off okay. with a relative relatively high cost so and limited production right so we can't go straight to the supermarket because we don't mm. have enough production supply so the early days will be in restaurants and then slowly we will go to, to supermarkets as well. We might do co-branding with other companies, manufacturers as well. So it's usually B2B. Got it. Sounds good. Okay. So I have a little bit more understanding of this new cell culture type of me. So a little bit about as an entrepreneur type of questions for you. So as a very successful, I say $30 million fundraisers, no joke, right? So as a very successful entrepreneur and a businesswoman, can you give 
give subscribers a little bit about uh, the type of issues you have encountered in terms of running a business, not only as a female, but in terms of an Asian woman right now in an area where it's mostly dominated male, I'm guessing, or in North America, because this is not super popular right now in Asia yet. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience about that? I think being in Asia, actually, the gender issue isn't that much, but we have had a lot of investors who actually really are focused on supporting women founders. Mm. So that's a benefit for us that we weren't okay. specifically looking for. And actually, a lot of the food tech companies sell based meats or plant-based meats. There are a lot of founders who are women. That's something unique in the food space that actually a lot of the people in the area are female so far. Challenges, I would say early days, there were a lot of people, especially in Asia, who questioned why our two female scientists who have stable paying jobs you know, going crazy and starting their own company. But that's really a small amount. And generally, we, you know, take their advice with a pinch of salt and take what applies to us. For us, when we started, we gave ourselves a timeline of 12 months. And if we didn't raise any funds, then we need to decide if business idea doesn't work and we need to find something else. One of us might decide to leave and all that. So a timeline really helped. But I think I would say the biggest challenge challenge as an entrepreneur be it a female or I think for me coming as a scientist not having a business background it's not easy but I think having my co-founder being willing to share and teach me as we go along is very helpful. I think the biggest challenge is people when you're doing startup. It changes very quickly as we continue to grow. We started with just two people less than three years ago and we have 30 over people on our team now. So we change quite quickly and things move quite quickly on the team. Making sure that we are hitting our milestones but at the same time preserving our culture and making sure people are happy is the biggest challenge i would say and as an entrepreneur mm, sounds good okay so last question i think this is we always ask this with all our guests so what are your future goals with shock meat as well as do you think this area in terms of the stem cell research and uh, culture meat is gonna be a big investment opportunity in the future yes um for us at shook meats right now we're still in research phase so we're not commercial yet we're working hard to commercialize. We're aiming for the start of 2023 to be in high-end restaurants in Singapore. And once we have that set up, we're looking to set up our manufacturing facilities in different Asia-Pacific hubs. Hong Kong, Australia, Japan, a lot of those countries are what we're looking for. I think local production will be important, you know, as part of the sustainability of the cell-based meats area. And is there a huge investment opportunity? I think, yes, right now investors are really looking to support a lot of the cell-based and plant-based area. But I would would say also there are quite a lot of competition right now so you really have to have a unique selling point be it in your technology some way to sell it make it cheaper make it bigger um, market focus different animal species those are things that you will need to think about to distinguish yourself from other types of companies that are out there Okay, got it. Very interesting stuff. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kai, for your time today. We've learned a lot about this very, very uh, innovative type of uh, investment that I have personally not heard of, about. So hopefully one day I'm going to try some of your product, uh, Shok Meat, in Singapore in one of the high-end restaurants. And as well as our subscribers, are definitely we would like to try this very, very different type of uh, investment in the future. All right, thanks again, Dr. Kai, for your time. Uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you for having me. Yeah, bye now. Shangan